Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Ken Friedman and welcome to another segment of the East Brunswick Advisory Health Council's Wellness Spotlight. As the expression goes, the hand that rocks the cradle is the one that rules the world. One of the most powerful influences of our self-image is mom. Our special guest today is Dr. Laura Ahrens Furstein, an analytic therapist for more than 30 years. She's just published her new book, My Mother, My Mirror. In the book, she explores how mothers unwittingly pass on their self-esteem and body images to their daughters and helps women break the cycle when parenting their own daughters. She has experience guiding women through the process of overcoming the hidden messages that keep women from reaching their fullest potential. I believe you'll find her engaging and enlightening. Welcome to the Wellness Spotlight, Dr. Furstein. Thank you for having me. Laura, could you take a couple of minutes and tell our viewers a little bit about your background and your experience? Sure, I'm a certified psychoanalyst. I'm a couples therapist. I'm also an author, a supervisor of clinical therapists, and also an instructor. I've been in this field of doing analytic therapy for over 30 years, and I have a doctorate that I earned at New York University, and I became a certified analyst at the New York Center for Psychoanalytic Training. And you live and practice locally? I live in practice in Highland Park, New Jersey. And you have 30 years of experience in this field, yes? Yes, actually a little bit more than that. <laughs> now, you have some very interesting insights that you included in your new book. Uh, could you tell us about them? What was it that made you write this book? Well, I was walking around one day and realized that in trying to understand ourselves as women, we really have a one-stop shop wherever we go. There's one minute on a magazine page we see a great diet and then the next minute we turn the pages and we see this uh, model that we're supposed to look just like. And so we're supposed to be dieting and then we're also, we see the models and then we see a recipe with these carbs and fats and heart unhealthy foods. And I realized that as a woman, we're always looking around us and trying to make decisions and we have a lot of sort of these, it feels like we're making decisions, but it, it feels a lot of times like we're really not. And I wanted to understand that better. So I started looking at women in my practice and finding patterns. And then my mother died and while I was, I was looking at these patterns, my mother died and I was sent back to a place myself of self-exploration in a way that I hadn't done years before in my own analysis, which was part of my own career. So that gradually led me to think about certain images that then led me to think I wanted to write a book that would sort of combine my insights and would be a way to translate some of the professional language that I had learned and to translate it for the lay public. So it would be user-friendly. And what were some of the key insights that you had? Well, I would say the core key insight, to be a little redundant, was the carnival mirror idea. I was thinking about it one day when I was treating a patient, and I'll call her Jenny, and she was talking about her nose and the fact that it's a man's nose. And her mother used to tell her that she had a man's nose. It was, it was like the noses on her father's side of the family. And this very attractive young woman, Jenny, was keeping herself back from a social life because of her nose. And for some reason, my own mind went to when I was a little girl, and I was looking in these fun house mirrors, and I would stare at one and then and laugh a little bit and then get a little wary and think, is this really the way I look? and then look at a true mirror and go back and forth like that. And I started thinking, you know, Jenny and patients like her are looking into carnival mirrors a lot of the time. They don't see themselves as they truly are. And that's keeping them back from fulfillment. So that was one of the core issues that kind of acted as a platform for me to begin this writing process. So it's really about 
awakening a consciousness in women about their true sense of identity and being able to free them from certain uh, images that they may have gotten from them about themselves from their mother is that what it's really all about right it's kind of what I call the legacy of the carnival mirror it's like an heirloom that's been handed down actually from great grandma it could have been to grandma to mom and then to us so it's 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 almost like a mental genetic exactly and then that way we relieve mothers of blame because I know that blame is a big issue. Yeah, I thought mothers. we got away from blaming mom, but now right. we're saying that we got this from mom. So how does that work out? Well, it's sort of like the way we get freckles from mom. <laughs> we don't go back to mom and say, you know, why did you do that? Why did you give me those freckles? If something is handed down unwittingly, we really, blame is not really in the picture. And actually, in my study and in my book, but also in my work with my patients, part of what I get at is trying to relieve, because I also see the moms, not just the daughters of the moms, to say, this is not a place for blame. It's a place to actually relieve ourselves of it, because we didn't know we were doing this. Now, many times we look at mom, and because of the love that we have for our mothers, we're appreciative of all the blessings that our parents have passed on to us. What are some of the, the negative things that we could get from this kind of relationship that could be damaging to a person's level of well-being? Well, it goes along with the idea of a skewed image. If she had a skewed image of herself, and in terms of women, because that's what my, my book focuses on the mother-daughter situation, but men are affected by this. So we're not to say that men are not in it, nor am I saying fathers are not in it. It's just that this is my premise in this book. Um, so if a mother looks at herself in a skewed way, if she's always seeing a carnival mirror when she looks at herself, that means she may, well, just to give an example, um, I know somebody whose mother always talked about food and dieting, and the mother was like five, ten pounds overweight. And so this, this acquaintance of mine grew up in, in a, with a feeling she's never really been able to enjoy lunch. Because whenever she sits down to lunch with her sister, she thinks, I have to control myself. And this, this friend of mine and her sister don't have any problem with weight, but they've been handed a carnival mirror self-image. Now, is this a slow drip that happens from the time that the baby's born and develops a relationship with its mother, or is, and it occurs over the course of a person's lifetime, or is it something that is imprinted from birth to a certain age, and then once it's in there, that's it, and it's fixed? Well, it, it's more the former, but the very early forming brain, and now we analysts and, and uh, therapists working in ways that, ha that involve us in neuroscience are thinking a lot about some of these ideas that the forming brain kind of gets ingrained, gets these neural pathways going in a certain way so that input ha is shaping some of these channels and then as we grow up those channels are there in our unconscious and the unconscious is actually, actually has a place in the brain and as, as neuroscientists are, are looking at it now and thinking about it. And so it's a gradual internalizing of this input. However, there is also a way at the same time that we're learning about the input, we're also learning how we can change some of that shaping and see ourselves differently as time goes on. If it's a distortion in who we are, then how do we know what's really us and how do we know what the distortion is? Well, that's a great question. I'm really glad you asked because a lot of what my work is about and a lot of what I talk about in the book that I call the five thought link phases has to do with basically first recognizing if you feel unfulfilled. Once you do that, if you recognize a pattern, then you can change it. So if you say to yourself as a woman in this case, you say to yourself, I have the blahs every day. I don't feel like I'm really having fun. I hold myself back from social experiences. Or you might say, I feel pretty good, but I've been wanting to be a painter all these years. Or I've been wanting to try this new uh, piano playing, and I just keep not doing it. Well, then you know something's keeping you back. Then you ask yourself, do I have a distorted self-image? Am I looking into a carnival mirror? And if you say yes, 
then you can start, and there are questions you can ask yourself that I have, but then you can start the process of looking at your mother's carnival mirror self-image and then gradually separating yours out from hers. So is the litmus test a feeling of unfulfillment? Is that where the process begins? Yes. I see. And once a person comes to that awareness, because I guess a lot of us would have feelings of not being fulfilled just because we live in very stressful times, things are very demanding, and I don't know of too many people who say that they have enough time to do the things that they really love and want to do. I mean, how do we know whether it's due to not being fulfilled because you're not really allowed to do the, I mean, I would rather play than have to go to work and do the things that uh, I, I would love to do all day. Who wouldn't? You know, we'd, we'd love to live the life of a child for the rest of our lives, but we grow up and we have responsibilities. So where is it being unfulfilled and where is it just facing the responsibilities that we've assumed? Well, it's a matter of perspective. We, we do, we have to live in this, in this very confined, at times, very uh, responsible, very pressurized kind of existence, especially in the Northeast. We know that, and in the big cities in this country, in the coasts. But it's a perspective that you have on something. It's a balance that you gain when you see yourself more accurately. For example, you don't have to just keep, let's say you're pushing at work, because you feel you have to prove something to your boss. And then you discover who's your boss underneath that disguise. It's your mother that you've been trying to prove something to your whole life. Well, maybe once you figure that out, you might say, OK, I've got to keep this job. I like my job, and I want to keep my job and do well at it. But maybe I don't have to work until you know, 8 o'clock every night in order to prove something. How does a woman repair the distorted self-image that she's inherited? Well, she repairs it first by making that identification of the pattern. Okay, so first you have to become aware of it. That's right. Okay, and how does she finally know, I guess it's a repeat of my previous question, how does she know what's the pattern and what's her authentic self? How does she separate the wheat from the chaff? Well, the pattern is easier to discover earlier. First, the pattern, you discover that because you say, I just don't feel fulfilled, for different reasons that I had mentioned earlier. Then you say, am I looking at myself accurately? And maybe you pick the area that you feel unfulfilled with. So let's say a woman says, um, you know, I keep myself back from uh, social engagements because I feel I'm always overweight and I just can't match these other women who just look, they just look just right. Um, so then you say, okay, that's the area. Now let me ask myself some questions. When I don't wear a bathing suit and I don't go to the beach, when my girlfriend Sue says, how about coming to the beach? Am I doing that because I really don't feel like going to the beach? Or is it because I'm saying that bathing suit that I have is going to show that little bit of extra uh, ounces that are on my stomach? And who is it that I'm going to be self-conscious for? Is it mom? Is it those people? Do the people at the beach see me that way? And is that a reason to keep myself from going? And if you start asking yourself those questions, you say, ah, I am having some sort of a carnival mirror situation here. What about the social pressures that can be even more powerful than mom uh, at times, like peer pressure? You know, as girls become adolescents, uh, there's a lot of social pressure for dieting, for behaving certain ways uh, that may not be acceptable. Uh, does that replace mom? And, and form a new carnival mirror that people look into? How does that work? Well, there's a cultural uh, carnival mirror that I also speak about. And one of them is this fact that these other women are buying into the same idea. The media one-stop shopping idea. Also, there's a, an, an issue of desire for women, by the way, that women buy into. And they influence other women who are feeling this carnival mirror and lack of fulfillment. But what I try to really emphasize is that regardless of how many other women are influencing you, regardless of how the culture does, regardless of how men do, if you plumb to the core of your carnival mirror self-image, you will find something about your mother-daughter relationship. And that's the core. That's guaranteed. That's guaranteed. How does that lead to 
difficulties and challenges like eating disorders and marital difficulties and depression and things like that? Well, eating disorders, I could give you an example. Uh, let's say you're looking at that magazine and you see that great recipe and mom maybe she loved baking all the time and she would bake and maybe give you the cake and then say oh you should you should watch your weight so you were caught in this kind of bind she didn't know she was doing it because her mom gave it to her and gave you the cake because you didn't feel good so here have something to eat right. you'll, you'll feel better right. comfort foods comfort foods or else maybe it made her feel good because she loved to bake and she wanted to feel she could gratify you if it's a marriage situation, well, I say sometimes look at the guy who's wearing with the beard and the testosterone and, uh, you know, maybe even snoring next to you and think, is there maybe mom under the surface of that beard and biceps? Because we marry people on some level that remind us of our parental figures. I mean, men marry us also because we remind them of their moms. But that one route, we all, we, it's very common for us to think we're marrying a guy who's like our dad. And it is very true. It's harder to recognize how sometimes that same guy is really our mom. Maybe she was critical. Did you ever notice how every time you put the dishes in the dishwasher, the guy you're living with is kind of moving those around and rearranging them? Well, now, according to what you're saying, you're not marrying a guy who's like your dad. You're marrying a guy who's more like your dad's mother. It could be, <laughs> but it could also be your mom. And it could still be like your dad. You know what I mean? I'm not saying it's only this or it's only that, but the woman part of it that's in the guy in your life. It could be your husband, it could be your partner, it could be your boyfriend, but there's not just dad and grandpa and uncle in there. There's also mom and grandma and mother-in-law in there. Uh, well, uh, it's almost like we're talking about Victor <laughs> Victoria now. Uh, yeah. You know, there are theories about us having a male and a female side, that everybody has a male and a female side. How do you feel about that, and how does that relate to your work? Well, I see it all the time in all of my patients, and I see it in myself. I mean... I grew up, I, I have an older brother, and, I, and I, there's a lot of me that, that wanted to do kind of the, the kinds of things he could do. And I love, there's something about driving in a certain kind of way, and I can't help it. I mean, it's just, there's a man's way of driving. There just is. And sometimes those things are more acceptable. And sometimes I just want to have that feeling of freedom and that kind of assertiveness that's part of, yeah, you know. Yeah, you know, so I have a couple of turbos on my car. <laughs> and, I, you know, I do think that's the man side of me. Until the cop pulls you over. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then maybe I move over to the woman's side and say, whoa, oh, And you're I was checking just, your makeup. You know. <laughs> so, uh, what can a woman do who has daughters? Now, uh, from speaking earlier, you told me that you have sons. Mm hmm. But you're a daughter, but you have two sons. So how do you use this work in raising your sons? Well, that's another question. <laughs> <laughs> they could probably answer that better than I can. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think sometimes I probably ask them too many times or one time too many, you know, well, how do you feel about that, you know? Um, I, I feel that my, my, my knowledge and my research is, is mostly based on two main things, that I am a daughter who had a mother and that I have been treating women for over 30 years. And I know about the, perspe the perspective of women as mothers and as daughters. So that's one major issue. Um, I, I think that Men are certainly involved in this, and, and what, what I know about men from having a husband and two sons certainly has gone into this book, and also having an older brother. But um, my tw the last chapter of my book is dedicated to mothers of daughters and what to do with this knowledge in raising daughters to break this carnival mirror self-image cycle, this legacy. Um, and the perspective in the book, I should say this, is mostly from a woman 
who is looking at herself while she's reading this as a little girl being influenced by her mother and, and connecting that with her present. Like it would be me reading this book and thinking, well, how did my mother influence me when I was that little girl? And now, how is that affecting my, my view of myself and my fulfillment? At what age should a daughter be aware of this so that she could filter out the carnival mirror experience between herself and her mom and be able to develop and focus on developing her authentic self? When she starts to really feel that she's not fulfilled. So that could be at any age, as long as she doesn't feel fulfilled. Yes, and I think the, the thing is that young girls, younger women, often don't even know it yet. Because in, in a, at a certain, this, my book is for any age woman. Absolutely any age woman could benefit from this. However, young, young women and teenagers are so caught up with life itself, the busyness of it, the fantasy of it, reaching their goals, that sometimes it takes a little bit for them to sit back, maybe after they've gotten the degree or they're, they've, got, they've gone through the college education or they've gone through the uh, work toward a certain uh, trophy or something, an, out, an outer trophy, then they might sit. And it might be even being in a committed relationship. And that's often when a woman will sit and say, and men too will say, but am I really fulfilled? And that's when reading, going toward the book is very, very timely for them. Well, fulfillment has a lot to do with values, doesn't it? Well, maybe you could elaborate on that just a In little. In other words, if, if we, if our, our, our lack of fulfillment or feelings of fulfillment really has to be based on whether or not our true values are understood and whether or not those needs and values are being realized and met. Well, that's true, so that if you're, look, if you're not fulfilled and you discover that you are looking at yourself through this, into, you're looking into this carnival mirror, well, that tells you that you're probably not able to even recognize when other people are misinterpreting your values. You may not even know what your value, you may not have defined your own values yet. That's what, you may be just carrying these values, let's say, for a woman now, that have been handed you from mother. And let's say one of those values would be that looks are everything. That's a perfect example. I'd like to go to another value. Okay. Okay, because we talk a lot about looks now. I want to talk about a woman who feels unfulfilled because she's not doing something with her life that she'd really like to do and she's home taking care of her children because that's what her mother did and yet feels unfulfilled because she would rather be doing something else, maybe out in the workforce or pursuing an education, something like that, and yet she's torn between her role as a mother and her love for her children and her family and yet her personal needs to be able to fulfill herself. How does a woman wrestle with issues like that, especially in the light of the, um, the influence by her mom? That is a great question. I'm really glad that you asked it because I have something. There was a book written on the mommy wars, and it's been a big issue in our culture, talking about those stay-at-home moms and then the, the women who decide to go to their careers, and there's kind of this underlying battle about who's a better mother and who's fulfilled more. And actually, I think that's just getting back to this carnival mirror, because it is about what's been handed down to you, and yet we do have to grapple with the reality of daily life. Of course kids do well when, we're, when they're loved, and when their mothers feel good about themselves. That's when kids really do the best. And time becomes a matter of quality, very often over quantity, so that you can be staying home with your child for, for, for uh, all the time, for years, and doing a wonderful job because you love what you're doing and you feel fulfilled. And even if you gave up that law practice, you say to yourself, this is more gratifying to me, and then when I'm done with this period in their life, I'm going to go back to law, maybe a part-time job, but it can also be you go home maybe and you're with your children a few hours a day and it's, or several days of the week like that, and you give them to other people for some of the time that you trust. 
but you love what you're doing in that outside world. You come home, you're a good role model because you love what you're doing, and in both cases, you're not going to let out your stuff onto your child because you're frustrated and angry. So it's really about your focus and balance. I mean, when people talk about having a balanced life today, you know, you have your personal life and you have your business life and then you have your family life. And whether it's men or women, it's pretty difficult to split yourself up 33 and a third percent because what winds up happening is you're in one place but you wind up thinking about those other things so you really lose the present time consciousness and focus that you would need to have to have a rewarding experience and feel fulfilled when you are where you are. So I guess what you're saying is that it's important to be in the moment wherever you are and give 100% of your focus, time, and attention wherever you are, and then that enables you to get the most out of that, and that's what really leads to a balanced life, not splitting it in equal amounts. It's not a, a, a quantitative thing, it's a qualitative thing. Well, yes, I would tweak what you said a little bit. Okay. Because, first of all, I want to reinforce that we're, none of us are perfect. And we're all dealing. Wait a minute. Uh, My mother said I was perfect. <laughs> well, that's from the next book about the men. <laughs> right. But, I mean, I, I think that, um, and the world isn't perfect. And we're, we're all being hit by all these cultural issues right now. So I just want to lay that out first. I think the most important thing is not so much necessarily that you're so focused in each moment, but that you've lifted the burden of guilt you've lifted the burden of living under the, the, the weight of the carnival mirror. So just as an example, if you had a, as a woman, if you had a mother who said to you, you, you have to stay home with your kids until they reach sixth grade or else they're not going to do well, it's a terrible thing you're doing, but in somewhere inside you, you've worked this through and you know that when you're not there, you have your husband there who loves them or your mother-in-law your mother or somebody else and you're so gratified by what you're doing and you know that when you come home you are going to be with your daughter and play that game with her and have fun with her. You know, you'll be exhausted too, I know that. But those times when you'll have fun with her because you weren't with her and you enjoyed yourself, that's when you are doing and you're also acting as a role model because you're giving her permission to enjoy herself and be a mom and maybe do some other things too. Um, Dr. Furstein, in addition to the great information that you have in your book, where else can our viewers find additional information and resources to be able to help them? Well, I have websites in my book and those websites are so that women can find analytic therapists, um, couples therapists, people with uh, psychodynamic training uh, at certain centers. And that it's very important that if you are going to enrich the knowledge that you have, and I do feel that my book can offer you a way of, of self-knowledge and self-improvement that can be very helpful, but I also feel there are those times when words on paper, they need to be enriched by work with a therapist. So that's what I would recommend. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Laura Ahrens Furstein, thank you so much for being our guest on the Wellness Spotlight. Your work is really about self-expression and there's no better form of self-expression than being your authentic self. That's what wellness is really all about. Thank you. I really enjoyed being here. This concludes another segment of the Wellness Spotlight. I'm Dr. Ken Friedman, President of the Advisory Health Council, reminding you that wellness works when you work it.